there is no one like Bruce Ario, and there never will be because he has his own little corner of the universe in these two books that I've edited of almost 600 poems. That there's not there's no one like he isn't just like uh, a lot of these people who you know they have this that or the other thing wrong with them or they play up for sympathies uh, because of they're from this group or from this religious group or or whatever it might be. Um, uh, Bruce Bruce is first and foremost a great poet and great writer, and secondarily he's an he's an, you can he'll probably become I think an avatar of mental ills if he his reputation can get out there. They will say, well, if a man who had you know, all the things we've listed that went wrong in his life, if he can come and do this, you know, people say, well, can't you be like Bruce Ario? And I think that's one of the things that's important, but it's not nearly as important as he's a great artist, first and foremost. Oh my God. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Artifact number 35. We're going to be covering on this show the life and times of Bruce Ario, a great Minneapolis poet. I'm joined by Dan Schneider of Cosmoerica.com. He is a poet himself, and he recently put together the selected poems of Bruce Ario. We also have uh, Bruce Ario's brother, Joel Ario. I believe that uh, he is about two years Bruce's uh, senior, um, or maybe junior. I forgot what Bruce uh, said a little while ago. But yeah, we're going to be covering Bruce's bi biography. I'm usually not too interested in the biography of artists, but um, you know, other people do find it very useful. And given the fact that we still have Bruce's relatives, people that he's known, right? This is going to be pretty important. And I, I also insisted and actually using some of Bruce's poems as sort of biographical backdrop. Um, we're not going to be analyzing them too much artistically, but uh, I think, you know, given the fact that Bruce died you know, fairly recently, uh, it was only 2022 that he passed away. Um, like just going over some of these poems of his that I've never seen before, uh, I definitely do feel like I know him much better. Uh, even if I had, for instance, like had dozens of like personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with him, simply having the poems, given how well crafted they are, how polished they are, right? I really get a much deeper sense of who he is as a person, more so than just even off the cuff conversation. So I think this would be a very useful conversation for future historians and and people who write poetry themselves. Um, maybe we could start with uh, Joel if you want to give anything by way of introduction uh, about Bruce Ario's life, um, anything that you find uh, relevant. And first of all, thank you so much, Alex and Dan, for paying this attention to my my brother. We knew always knew him to be a special uh, brother in, a, in, in the areas that you're teasing out here. I think uh, we didn't know as much as, as you guys have uncovered. And so it's uh, really, really gratifying to see the time and effort you put into understanding Bruce's work. And uh, Bruce used to always say that uh, he, 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 most writers aren't famous in their own time. And uh, he always had this aspiration that maybe he would be. So maybe this will help uh, shine some more light on, on his poetry. Because I will say that it was only after his death that I paid as much attention as I have to his writing. And I'm no literary critic, but I, but I have found it, you know, meaning in his work and appreciate the work that you guys are doing. I, there are four boys in the family. I'm the oldest, Bruce is next, and then he's a brother two years younger and then a brother 12 years younger. So four boys grew up in Minnesota, pretty traditional Minnesota type family, very athletically and outdoorsy kind of uh, uh, family. Bruce is always the most sensitive of the, the four of us and, uh, you know, encountered some issues when he was in his late teenage years that led into, a, you know, bouts with mental illness and but he, uh, as as we'll talk about, you know, went on to live a rich and very full life. And so look forward to talking to you guys about that. Well, if I can just, as just, just for the record. So Joel is the oldest, then Bruce, then David, and then Kevin. Correct. Okay. 
Yeah, the birthday, the birth dates are just how ours. I can't remember anybody's age anymore. So I'm born 1953, Bruce 55, David 57, and Kevin 65. That's an interesting detail about the uh, sensitivity. Uh, there's always this kind of like a desire among critics and historians to say, okay, well, let's go through this person's biography and try to understand, you know, what is it about their childhood that that cr turned them into an artist, right? And uh, th th I think that's a kind of silly way to to view things, right? There's so many random little variables that go into uh, becoming an artist. Like it's almost as if if you change one variable, no matter how minuscule, you might very well not end up with an artist, much less a, a great artist like Bruce was. Um, but th that sensitivity, right? Uh, th that is probably relevant, right? Because his best poetry often is highly personal, right? Very often whenever there's a sort of I uh, there, uh, the pronoun I, um, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's it's both it's both emotionally charged as well as sometimes a bit intellectual too. But that emotionalism turned out to be pretty important, right? He he has maybe what we would call, uh, I guess, in layman's terms, like a bit of a confessional style. Um, so that is an interesting detail about his upbringing. Um, Dan, if you want to uh, sort of say anything about Bruce by way of introduction, well, I don't I don't think you we could fall into the trap of thinking that the I in the poems or even the main character in his, as far as I know, only single great novel, City Boy, is him. Because I know Bruce told me that 95% of City Boy was what happened to him, but 5% or so he made up and uh, for, for dramatic uh, purposes and other, other things go along there. So I don't want to fall into that trap. And I know having read poems and having talked with Bruce and having him brought, brought poems to the Uptown Poetry Group. Um, yes, he would write about certain things and his beliefs and and uh, often things that happened to him, but it, it, it would be a task to try to separate what was something that actually happened to Bruce and something that he might have imagined while sitting on a bus throughout the poems, riding buses, because after the accident, Bruce never drove. Uh, so riding buses, uh, there are certain themes that come up again and again. And it, you know, you don't want to fall into that trap with like Woody Allen, as you know, having written a book about him, of, of making Woody Allen the character, Woody Allen the man. They're separate, but there's going to be 90, 95% overlap. Yeah, I, I agree with that assessment. The only reason why I brought up here specifically is, I mean, he has said before that, for instance, many of the, uh, you know, I instances in the poems, uh, they do refer to many of his own beliefs. And um, uh, granted, you know, there's always going to be differences, right? Uh, and, and that's always uh, important to to keep in mind. Um, maybe we could start uh, with uh, this, with his early life, right? Um, there's 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 a comments that he's made. I know, for instance, that he was interested in sports. Right, uh, Joel just mentioned that he had these kinds of sensitivities. Maybe we could just say with that for a second. When you say that he was a, a sensitive child, maybe more so than the rest of his family, what exactly does that mean? How, in practical terms, did this tend to play out in the household or in his studies or whatever? Again, it was it was an athletic family. My dad played a couple college sports and was always active in athletic pursuits. He was a he was a high school teacher, a philosophy teacher, so very serious kind of thinker, but also very interested in the sports. He coached all of us boys through sports. Uh, it was the two younger boys that actually had the real athletic genes in the family. So Bruce and I had more academic type genes, uh, intelligence genes, and the and so we didn't get, partake as much in the sports, but we were constantly involved in sports and. And my dad coaching us in sports and that sort of thing. And Bruce played sports through high school. But of the four of us, you know, so then there's a lot of roughhousing in the family and that sort of thing, too. And of the four of us, I think Bruce was the one that would most likely be kind of injured by something or, or otherwise feel like, you know, this is getting too rough and kind of pull back from it a little bit. And by the time he was in ninth grade, you know, it was the late 60s, he was the first of the family to kind of be more into the counterculture stuff. Uh, I remember it as, a, you know, I was in high school, kind of more of a traditional high school kid still at that point, not paying a lot of attention. And Bruce would be saying to me, Joel, you don't get it. You know, there's this thing going on in the country. It's kind of the Charlie Wright, Greening of America stuff. And Joel, you just, you're just clueless. You know, this, the world is changing and you don't, you don't sense it. You just don't pay any attention. So he, that's the kind of energy that he had 
you know, and in, in even before those years in that kind of in the family. Um, yeah, I, I listened to something that he uh, did with, I believe it was with his church. This was sometime in June of uh, uh, last year. And he said something along the lines of by the time that he was a teenager, he became pretty uh, rebellious with his parents. Uh, he didn't really elaborate on that, but uh, what what exactly was uh, was that? What, what what form of rebellion? Well, he grew his hair long, and he liked marijuana back in those days, and uh, you know, was just again kind of part of that. You know, don't criticize what you can't understand from the you know from the old line that I love. Um, sort of sort of attitude. I think I think it's fair to say all of we were raised to be kind of you know a thing for ourselves type people. My dad was 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 famous for you know kind of saying to his students, you know, you need to think for yourself. Not you know he'd get himself in trouble actually at school by inviting in you know like the socialist professor from the university that almost lost his job and when we were you know pretty young goose would have only been 10 years old at that time and so there, it was a family of you know kind of liberal free thinking kind of people and, and you know make up your own mind and so all of us i think had our forms of rebellion and bruce certainly did as well uh can i just ask a question um uh, joe i know when your father died about 10 12 years ago frank Ario. Uh, Bruce, I remember, had shown me uh, some article. I think he had, I, it, it, it wasn't in his possession, possessions that Dave sent me, but I think he had like a chapbook or something of, you know, clipped articles, you know, and probably 40 or 50 articles, as I recall, of his father and people remembering him. Uh, he, he seemed to have been uh, a, a figure of some esteem within the uh, academic community of the Twin Cities. In, in my dad's last year of life, I, he knew he was going to die within a year, and I wrote like about six or seven stories about him and had occasion to talk to a lot of different people about those things. 400 people at his funeral. Um, I still meet people that say, Frank Ario, he was the first person that really said to me, you know, you need to think for yourself. And I had, a, I don't know, maybe 200 letters that I went through that he'd gotten over the years from people who said you were the first person who got it me to think for myself and so forth so yes a very esteemed person in the in the in the community um all the way all the way through those years was there a prop before we get to the accident and other kinds of turning points in his life was there anything so, so first of all i assume the accident occurred what in his early 20s uh, 1979 and so he's born in 50 24 24 yeah yeah so uh, before uh turning 24 is there anything else uh significant uh either at the time or in retrospect that you could now uh see a significant whether it's like maybe any kind of budding artistic interests or things that he might say or do um any other kind of turning points pri prior to this one uh that uh we should know about I don't think so. One thing I like to cite is that all four of us boys were like, you know, homecoming king candidates in high school. So we were all kind of, you know, even though we had different styles and Bruce was more counterculture for sure than the rest of us at that time, we were all kind of like popular in high school and did well achieved. And, you know, Bruce went out to Carleton College and, you know, kind of just general, you know, you would have thought, oh, this is a model kind of family. And, and so Bruce is kind of bout with mental illness in, in 1979 was the first kind of time that the family sort of, you know, was a little bit of a blow to kind of all of a sudden the family where everything seemed to go well for everybody, all of a sudden there's a little bit of trouble there. So so I, I, were there signs before that of anything like that? I don't really, I think it would be hindsight that would be making stuff up to say that. I don't really see it. Well, can I just, uh, uh, was there any sign or any history in the family of mental illness or uh, drug or addictive personalities? Could Bruce, what was Bruce an addict or a, uh, alcoholic before the accident or, or that came after? Uh, yes, I think there's a, there's addiction issues to the family. I mean, this the family history would be that on my dad's side, his dad was a pretty bad alcoholic and there was some, you know, sort of a family abuse issues in the in his childhood. Um, with it, and his dad left for Alaska when, you know, he was young. Um, and, uh, and then on my mom's side, um, you know, her father also pretty bad alcoholic for years, kind of re reformed himself in, in his like about mid sixties, maybe. So both my parents kind of preached this, 
notion of, you know, we have uh, addiction tendencies in the family, be careful with those kind of issues. And, you know, I'd say all four, all, well, three, maybe not Kevin, but three of us have had some kind of, you know, issues with, with addiction over, over the years. Bruce and, and my next brother, David, the most serious. So uh, in so in 1979 is when he has uh, his accident, right? So uh, the idea is he was drunk driving. Uh, he got into an accident. This causes a traumatic brain injury. Was it specifically from that point on that uh, you guys started noticing something strange about him? Um, did all, all, all these issues start uh, occurring like right after that? Did it take a, a long time to really build up or, or what exactly did that before and after look like? Well, I was in Boston by that point. So I was not as much in that. I wasn't in touch day to day. Um, and my parents really didn't say much to me and Bruce didn't say much to me over that course of the year from 79 to the spring of 1980. But when in, 19, in the spring of 80 is when he had the kind of what they called the psychotic break at the time. And, you know, I kind of rushed home from Boston and it was just, you know, kind of hit me like a ton of bricks that, you know, there was any even any issue. And my parents then said, well, Bruce has been acting kind of weird and difficult since the, since the fall. It wasn't as much tied to that car accident at that point. That's become kind of the story. But, you know, I tend to believe these things have lots of different kinds of ways to under roots and so forth. And so it's become kind of a stylized story. It was just that accident that completely changed everything. But but certainly during that year, he started coming home and having different thoughts and challenging my parents more about the way they brought him up, according to them later. And when I came home, he was definitely in a situation where he was, he'd lean into me and talk kind of gibberish at me. I, the thing he said, this is, I still remember it. I, sucked the life out of Nikki and she gave it back to me in the face. You know, this kind of weird sexual illusion. And he just, he said, Joel, you just have to understand this. And I, you know, it's just like, Bruce, I'm not following what anything you said. So it was really, you know, kind of difficult. And then, but his doctor, Tubney Rhodes, still o really overreacted to him. And I remember saying, Bruce, you know, doctor, you treat him like this. He's not, you're not going to get to him. And Bruce kind of just willed his way out of that hospital. Basically, they couldn't keep him because he had enough willpower, just got himself out of there. And from 79 until 83, four years there, he, you know, held himself together. He went to law school for two years in there, made his way through two years of law school and was kind of, you know, basically doing okay. But it was really clear that there was something wrong. And we all felt, I felt strongly, it was going to be some kind of, you know, break point here that he was just wound too tightly, just kind of angry at the world and so forth. And then he kind of started crashing in the fall of 83. And that eventually led to that incident where he took off all his clothes and ran through the mall of, you know, downtown Minneapolis malls in January of 84. And then that's where he really kind of crashed, sort of hit bottom and, you know, then had, you know, a period of kind of recovery and then eventually found his way you know, within a few years there to some programs that kind of got him on the path that he was on of being a writer and a, you know both a successful writer and a successful kind of person in the world with his job and leading a mailroom and all that kind of stuff but but there was a period where he you know had crashed then came back then kind of crashed again and and then kind of put his life together if I could just ask a couple of questions, Alex, because I, I talked with Bruce about this, and I just want to hear, uh, uh, you know, a, a different viewpoint. So, Bruce then had the psychotic break. I, I know he, he's he's talked about this and written about this, so this is public information. Or anyone who Google's Bruce Ario or his books that he put out on Amazon by himself. Um, so he he has the the breakdown. He thinks he's like Jesus uh, in the the skyway. Uh, which is an elevated, uh, just for those who don't know, in the Twin Cities, it's elevated uh, bridges between buildings. Uh, and then he he gets arrested. Uh, he he famously talks about an incident where he tried to drink his own urine. Uh, and then and then uh, one of the things that, oddly enough, over the years, with with emails to me and my wife Jessica and and, and talking with him on the phone or, or, or whatnot, he would sometimes get these odd. He, he wasn't embarrassed about any of that. And I, I, again, this is public knowledge because he's written poems about it. 
he he always seemed to have a little uh, embarrassment over the fact that he had a fetish for female nylons. Um, and I was just wondering, when you were talking about him, these sort of gibberish things about the sexuality, did, did Bruce always have this kind of alternate sexuality? Because I don't think he was gay or anything like that, but he, he was a little bit outside the norm. Well, yeah, they, you know, it's interesting because the gay thing wasn't, you know, it's, it's so much different world these days, but I, I'm pretty sure Bruce would have been, you know, I mean, I think, again, being from this liberal family, I think maybe all of us think, you know, that uh, that the, the, all genders on a continuum for everybody, but we didn't used to express it that way. So, but if Bruce were alive today, I think he would feel like, yeah, you know, the idea that every, somebody's all male or all female, it's crazy. Everybody just some combination and he would have been probably more exploring it back then you know that i think that nylon thing was part of exploring that and but that was a you know kind of, kind of a thing not to be talked about i didn't know any of that at the time i i've known about it since then but you know yeah and he, he, there was certainly no talk in the family about about any of, of that my dad only at the very end of his life kind of was able to disclose that he had been you know abused by one of his basketball coaches back when he was you know, like in eighth grade or something, but none of, none of that was part of what we talked about. It was not the world we are in today. Yeah, um, maybe we should uh, stick with this topic a little bit since I have some poems, uh, I guess, related to the subject. Um, so it, it seems, especially later on in, in his life, uh, Bruce was feeling, you know, very kind of like romantically lonely, right? He has uh, many poems of romantic and sexual longing and um I, I i i almost wonder if like this whole kind of nylon fetish has to do with the fact that I, I think at some point he does mention that he's like interested in in women's legs which is a very common you know a male thing i mean uh, i assume most heterosexual males uh find uh, uh an attractive you know pair of legs attractive um, but it's almost as if like, you know, in retrospect, I see he's getting progressively more and more lonely in that regard, right? Nylons become this thing, uh, like almost like a symbol of something that, uh, he could have, but uh, maybe can't, right? Uh, he's, uh, he's sort of maybe using it as a stand in for women. And he, he has this one poem lofting into friendship, lofting it into friendship that, uh, I think is pretty, uh, interesting topically, especially maybe some of the things in the news now. So let me just read it. And for the people that are uh, uh, doing this video audio podcast, if you're watching video, you could actually see the poem I'm going to put up on the screen. So the poem is lofting it into friendship. I may have had designs. I don't really know. It's all unimportant now because she just wants to be friends. I've heard the words before. The sound of a yellow light blinking. It's warning. Friendship, though, that's not bad. It could have taken worse turns. I could be thankful. Friends is where it ends. So uh, the reason why I find this interesting is whenever uh, I see Bruce's uh, poems or the novel, or like uh, even when he's just like talking about women, uh, despite the fact that he has lines like, you know, I haven't had sex in 30 years or whatever, he never has ever like gotten very visibly bitter or resentful, right? There's a lot of stuff about incels, right? Involuntary celibates in the news, right? There's personalities like Andrew Tate that are, you know, just kind of like fueling this kind of like, you know, male sex sexless sexlessness and trying to sort of profit off of it. But Bruce, despite the fact that he very much fit into the category of a man who wants romance and cannot get it. Uh, he continues to be, you know, totally sensitive, right, to women, uh, never, ever entitled, never, you know, making any kind of uh, demands, right, always sort of, you know, uh, remaining respectful in that regard, being totally understanding why, you know, maybe some women wouldn't be attracted to a man with uh, uh, either mental health problems or maybe feels like uh, he can't provide for them in, in the way that uh, he might be expected to. Um uh, like, can, can you say anything about his maybe romantic relationships uh, after uh, his his breakdown and and what that looked like? Did he ever have any extended relationships or what? Well, I think I sort of think of that poem as, in, to the extent it's literal and related to 
his view, you know, his relationships with women. He definitely, in the last 20 years of his life, kind of bemoaned the fact that he wasn't having, you know, success in finding a companion. He would always talk about, you know, sexual companion and, uh, you know, getting married. He, he, to almost the end of his life, would talk as if, you know, he was going to find somebody to get married to and have that kind of, you know, partner in life. But he seemed mostly to end up with women. There seemed to always be women around in the last 20 years, but they were mostly older women, almost like mother figures or something, you know, 15, 20 years older than him, which by then might be 70 years old or something. Um, and so th th this just never panned out. But he, you know, he spent time on the, some of the dating services for a while, trying to make, uh, get companions that way. He visited prostitutes back in the day, you know, kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I do think there were issues there, but, you know, earlier, I, I would say not. I mean, he had the normal kind of girlfriends and so forth through high school and, and college. And I, if you ask me, does he have any particular problems that way? I'd say no, other than he was probably, you know, some girl said something to him, he would be on the sensitive side to sort of over read or overreact to what might have been a, you know, incidental comment or something. You know, he was, he was always like, you know, I, hurt by something that other people might not be hurt by, I guess is a way I'd say it. Um, yeah. But I, but I, I don't think there's, I certainly agree with your characterization that he didn't harbor any kind of deep-seated anger or frustration or something like that, 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 that would, you know, make him an incel or anything close to that. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was generally true though, for kind of his relationships with everybody, almost everybody at the end of his life. I mean, even more than I really realized that, you know, it's hard to remember a time when Bruce didn't have a generous or, you know, kind kind of thing to say. If he was, he was quiet a lot of the time, he would, he'd come to dinners and he would withdraw after dinner, you know, he just sort of, he could overload it. He didn't want to have too much interaction, but he, but he would withdraw. He would not kind of all of a sudden lash out with some, I, I don't remember a single time where he just like all of a sudden, like we all do, just kind of lashed out with some, you know, Un, ungracious comment that just kind of reflected a, you know, something going on in his life that that he was upset about. Uh, if I could comment here, because uh, I did talk with Bruce in the last, uh, well, since Jessica and I moved from Minneapolis down to Texas, uh, almost twenty years. Uh, there were a few women that I know that he dated and met on dating services, and Bruce may have been uh, a celibate for thirty plus years. But it wasn't a voluntary. It wasn't an involuntary uh, celibate because there were a few women that that, according to him, did have designs on him. But Bruce, just as with the the sort of guilt that he had about the nylon fetish thing, there was one woman I remember about five to ten years ago, uh, and I don't remember her name. Uh, but Bruce went out with her for I think two or three months, and I remember one time talking to him, and uh, he's he said, "Dan, I, I just, I just can't." see myself with her and i was like why bruce and he said well she's big meaning she was heavy and he was like he was like you know i i like to put my arms around a woman and he going i said that bruce and he felt guilty about this and i said bruce you don't owe that your love to someone just because she might be a nice person you know every one of us has been rejected by someone because of something seemingly shallow, you know, looks, you've got four eyes, you're too fat, you do this, to that, dark enough skin or whatnot. And I said, you know, if you don't feel something, you, 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 you know, don't stay with this woman dating her, giving her false hope when you don't feel something for it. And, you know, he would be he'd like, yeah, I know you're right. But, but you know, and he, he had that kind of thing to, sh to shrug it off. And there were a couple of other women, I think, here and there that he also probably could have pursued something with. Again, as uh, uh, Joel said, they were his age or maybe a little bit older. So it wasn't going to be uh, having a family or, or, you know, the nuclear family thing. But Bruce could, he, you know, he could have gotten, uh, he could have ended his celibacy. Uh, but, you know, he had his own standards that still gnawed at him, uh, I guess. Well, just to be clear, he, he never talked to me and to my knowledge to my brothers about being celibate. And yeah. I, I, my sense, I, I thought that line was probably not true, that he's not had sex in 30 years. That would fit in what Dan said, that he sometimes says things that aren't true. Like he would feel like I never had sex and I wanted to 
own up as the kind of sex I would like to have, but I'm, I suspect he did have sex and not just with prostitutes, but other, you know, people that he dated too, because he was active in those dating services. So I, I suspect he did have more of a sex life than maybe that, certainly than that comment suggests, but I don't know. I just know that when he talked about women, he was talking about finding a life partner that he couldn't get that, and he, but he never talked about it in terms of, I can't get sex. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, and also just commenting on uh, the whole uh, visiting of a uh, prostitute's part of his life. Uh, I believe he said at some point that he lost his virginity to a prostitute. Um, I'm not sure if I'm just sort of like uh, reading into it somewhere else, but that's my understanding. And he has this poem, right, that deals with perhaps some of this guilt. Now, he doesn't explicitly <laughs> state that this is about visiting a prostitute, but, um, you know, piecing together a uh, you know, bits of his biography, I guess you could figure it out. And also some clues within the poem itself. Uh, it's titled Waltz In, Waltz Out. Sometimes you hardly know you've been there, except you've got a receipt. And there's a chunk of your watch gone. But down the road you remember, could be the fragrance that gives it away. And you wonder if it matters. There are no pictures, no tape recordings. You're sure no one will know. But you know better. The long, hard night has just begun. Right. So I guess that speaks to uh, some of the guilt he feels. I'm not sure if this is uh, guilt related to feelings of like, you know, uh, maybe he feels that prostitutes in general are an exploited class of people. Maybe he simply felt that there was something uh, unduly transactional, right? Uh, here, especially since. Um, you know, he had this like budding sort of uh, interest in in religion, uh, or maybe it was like something else altogether. But uh, you know, there is the guilt, right? It's there. Uh, he does talk about it uh, somewhat differently in City Boy, where um, it was almost as if like he was responding to this idea that you know all these people want you to feel guilty about it, uh, but in fact, you know, he he was at least the, the character in City Boy says something like, uh, but. You know, I respect these women and I enjoy my time with them and I do view them uh, as people, right? Uh, maybe that doesn't necessarily placate uh, the feelings of guilt, but there's also perhaps that that other side of it, right? I mean, it is kind of a, a complex thing to think about, especially in light of the religion, right? I mean, most uh, Christians, I would assume, would be much more traditionally uh, guilty about this. They wouldn't have complex feelings about it. They probably would have fairly simple feelings about these experiences, but um, uh, not Bruce in this regard. Um, so one last thing, uh, I, I did find uh, interesting how uh, uh, around the time that he received this brain injury, he told Dan in the conversation they had six or seven years ago, something like, uh, people started telling me that right after the injury, that's when I started saying weird things. And what he characterized weird things is the following. He said, first, I started talking about Jesus. And the second thing that he mentioned was uh, I started uh, talking about how unjust the world was and all the things that were wrong with it. And I found especially that second part kind of interesting to hear because you would think that a person that is, in fact, uh, well-adjusted to the world, right, and is, in fact, sensitive to what's happening in the world, they would, in fact, have these feelings about the world, right? They would understand, well, there is very clearly any number of injustices. We should be thinking about them. We should be talking about them. Um, but uh, uh, I guess the way that he was describing it was it was almost a, a kind of negative now. And he also mentioned that, that that's when he started like telling his parents, you know, there's all these problems in the way that you raised me. Um, so was there this kind of like uh, uh, kind of like, uh, uh, I guess, the raised stakes in terms of how he felt about the world soon after the brain injury? Like, was he did he suddenly become like, for instance, like much more political not not in the terms of like you know a democratic party activist or anything like that but just having these very strong feelings about the way things are and uh, either trying to change them or just having you know emotional responses to them yeah there's no, there's no question that in retrospect that kind of fall when he had the car accident seemed to have been a, a pivotal point where his, his, his 
sense of things got very vivid in his inner, I think of it as his inner life in a Jungian kind of way that he just kind of started having a really vivid inner life that just kind of, you know, was constantly threatening to sort of overwhelm him. And, and uh, you know, he, he, he's, he kept that all of his life. He'd say, you know, I could get into that more about the angels or about Jesus or about Dylan or about Nikki. Nikki, by the way, I, I just, the idea that he lost his virginity to a prostitute seems uh, extremely unlikely to me. I'm pretty sure he was having sex back in like ninth and 10th grade when everybody was in, in his kind of part of the culture, the counterculture. I, I'd be shocked if he wasn't having sex when he was at Carlton those years. I was at St. Olaf across the river. You know, so I, I think these things in the prostitutes all started later as far as I know. So I, so I think he, again, would, you know, it probably was fairly normal childhood and all those kind of ways until he had this accident. Then he started getting really vivid on these things. And he no doubt was fixated. There's a particular woman who she, she and I worked in the same place. I know her. She's an stunning person, you know, that, that, um, that I, he had a, you know, very intense sexual relationship with right around that same time. And somehow in, because of the car accident, it all connected to her. So he talked about Nikki still to the end of his life in ways that, you know, she just, was one of those made a deep, deep impression on him. And I think, you know, I think he wanted to keep that relationship. And she was, you know, the kind of person who probably had, you know, three or four boyfriends at a time, always, um, sort of thing. So I just this didn't work that way for him. But but anyway, yes, he got more and more vivid and religion was a big part of it. Certainly the political thing was very much a part of it. Kind of everybody in the family, except maybe my youngest brother at various times have been most of my life's been around crusading around various political things. So, you know, it's just the whole kind of family ilk. And so he had that deep in him. But but he would always take these things to just a deeper level. So his religion involved, like, you know, we'd have to tell Bruce, you can't, you know, 10%, even 15% of your money to the church, that's fine. But not 50% of your money to the church. That's too much. You can't give that much away of your money. He just get carried away in those kind of ways in some years. And the politics too, the way, yes, Bruce, it's totally right. I totally agree with you that this is an extreme injustice, but you know, you can't just obsess about it. You know, you gotta move on. Kind of that all of that was the was kind of part of the theme here. And it all just got kind of, you know, and it spun out to the point where he just kind of lost the I feel I feel like in some basic way he lost the connection between his inner feelings about all this stuff and his ability to have a outer life that's connected to other people in a more normal way. And, you know, kind of that all snapped for him in some, you know, some way. I sort of put all these things in that kind of context more than I do, like it was a particular brain chemistry kind of issue. Uh, I just want to ask Joel something. Um, in I, I, I did the selected poems, and then uh, when I got, uh, I still got Bruce's stuff right back here. Uh, uh, when I got the the PC of his that I had someone go in and I got uh, some other poems and, and stuff too, later poems. Uh, uh, and in some of the later poems, he speaks about 40 years ago, uh, he met a couple of Satanists and there are about three or four poems that he really rips into a woman and another man. And he ends one of his poems about, you know, some blah, blah, blah. And with to the woman, sometimes you just got to dump them. And so it w- that that sounds like that might be this Nikki woman. Yeah, N- Nikki, I I know because I you know I, I, we both worked at the same restaurant in downtown Minneapolis at different times, and her mother was my boss, and she was around, and so I just I have a very vivid image of her still. The other guy, Bert, that he was talking about is the devil. He would always talk about Bert was the devil, and that was some bartender at the same, you know it's the Radisson Hotel in downtown Minneapolis, um, and. I don't know who Bert was, whether it was a real person or a composite or what, but he, but, you know, Nikki was this sexual obsession of his and Bert was this devil obsession of his. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I remember that from a uh, city boy. Now that you mentioned it, I remember there was like some scene about, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, this man was the devil. And, and the interesting part was that I think in city boy, uh, the narrator doesn't even get explicit about what made him the devil. It was just this kind of, you know, it was just kind of this thought that possesses you and you just kind of go, go, go with it, right? Um, and within the logic of uh, whatever's going on in that, you know, mental space, it seems 
you know, it seems logical, right? It's this kind of this idea of like a totally logical lunatic, right? It's maybe built upon an edifice of illogic, but uh, when you get to the specifics, right, you could sort of make the details cohere in whatever way that you wish, and it seems sensible. Um, Just say, go say one more thing about it. But I could imagine the sort of scene being that Bruce was totally enamored with Nikki and kind of hanging out with her and thinking this was, you know, the love of his life and. Bert was telling them, you know, uh, use it as much as you can right now, Bruce. Just take everything you can get from her because she's going to screw you, you know, soon. And 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 that and then he would think of her, him, and Bert as the devil in that situation. And mm -hmm. just something about the way those experiences connected to when he had this accident made them like, you know, focal points for a lot of the thinking that he did over time and the way he expressed himself. And you know, he just channeled a lot of that really tumultuous kind of energy into some pretty amazing writing uh, throughout his life. But some of those focal things were back at, at the time, right around the accident. So I, I want to ask about uh, his, uh, I believe it was a six month period of homelessness uh, a few years after uh, the brain injury. Um, I assume he was already sort of like in, yeah, he was in into drugs at the time. And he said that he was using his spare money to just buy alcohol so uh, I, I guess like two parts of the question. The first one is what exactly uh, precipitated the homelessness? Was it drug abuse? Was it uh, a, a was it a mental woes? Was it a loss of a job? Was it all three? And second, uh, did he try to just keep this a secret from his family? Because you mentioned, for instance, that you were you know already in Boston at the time. Maybe you weren't really in contact. Uh, I can imagine you know someone like Bruce, especially if he has these kinds of like strong moral opinions maybe he might feel it's an imposition to you know tell anyone about his, his homelessness especially his family um you know so uh, at least that's how i'm imagining it so uh, what exactly are the details on that well so that was the fall of 83 so we're a couple years later he's that's when he's supposed to be in his third year of law school and he's just you know things aren't hang, hang, hanging together and kind of by that point you know there was enough talk in the family that, you know, Bruce was definitely struggling. And we all felt after he came out of the hospital that first time that that doctor had sort of created a clash of wills and Bruce had kind of toughed his way through it, but he wasn't going to be able to tough his way through his whole life. It just wasn't who Bruce was. It probably wasn't who anybody could be with the set of issues he was dealing with. And so he just kind of would try to maintain, but then kind of fall back. And, you know, by the fall of 83, you know, my mom was saying, you know, Bruce is in a lot of trouble. And I still, you know, I talked to my mother every Saturday morning for like an hour at that time. And that's all those years I'm in Boston, but I'm talking to her. And a lot of the conversation back then was about Bruce, but she was definitely soft peddling it to me too, because after Bruce died, I had the file now that my mother had of like what went on that fall. And it's just, really excruciatingly painful to read through my mom's notes. She was just, you know, Bruce is not going to make it. What can I do? And she's checking with this doctor and that doctor. Can we get him committed? Or you can't get him committed. Can he commit himself? Can he get on some, some sort of subsidy? Just like a mother just agonizing over her child, lost child, trying to figure out how to help him and having every sense that he was not going to kind of get through this by himself. He needed help, but you know, he wouldn't take it from that, my parents. He wouldn't take it from anybody else. And then, you know, it was three months late. So that whole fall was probably just hellish for him. He, for a while, he was sleeping, you know, over at the U. I mean, they were kind of letting him, you know, as this former law student who's gone crazy now. And, you know, but he's trying to sleep in, like, the classrooms and just leave him alone. And then they decide, well, no, we can't do that. So they told him he couldn't be there anymore. Just all kinds of stuff like that going on. And then eventually, you know, these predictions came true and he, had, takes off all his clothes and runs through the, you know, had elevated uh, uh, walkways, as Dan described them, you know, and and uh, gets a, gets arrested. And he describes himself as, you know, I was trying to, you know, show the people of the world, uh, you know, with, uh, you know that uh, we can all be free or, you know, those kind of words was what he was using at that time. They got punched in the jaw in jail that night and kind of, you know, all broke his jaw. And it was just, a, it was a horrible period. And then, he, but out of that, he finally did meet somebody who was a good a good enough counselor to get him into treatment. And from that point, it was a fairly steady path, as I understand it. I'm sure not as steady as I think it might have been to getting into tasks and becoming, you know, like a successful 
rehabilitated person who who was the poster child for TAS for the last 20, 30, well, it's from the fall of like 88 or so. He was like, you know, he spent his time going around locally and nationally talking about mental health and how the police should deal with people with mental health crises and just all kinds of things. And he, you know, ran a mailroom, you know, staff and, you know, he, I mean, Bruce is the hardest one to see when I'd come home for, you know, I've always lived away from Minneapolis, you know, and he was the hardest one to see because while I can't do it that day because I'm at church and then I got my karate lessons and then I'm running the, you know, the store, the, the used clothing store, the charity. He was just running a full, he ran 10 marathons in that period of time from the early 90s to the mid 90s, early, late 80s, mid 90s. So it's just kind of active and just doing stuff and then writing a lot. I didn't realize how much he was writing. So, so you know, that's kind of the arc of all that. So so the period of homelessness uh, ended specifically when he got arrested for like indecent exposure and got essentially committed. Is that what it was? Yes, yes. I think okay. I, and he, did, he never did get committed because he voluntarily then went in. So that was part of the dance in the courts was you know, he had to agree to things so that they didn't have to involuntarily. Yeah, because the laws are still, well, we still wrestle with that, right? The mayor of New York still have trouble now, like, can it, should you take people off the street or not take people off the street? Um, mm. It was just tough to figure out what to do back then. But I, I again, I don't think it was as much as, it was a six-month period, it was completely homeless. I think it it probably was before that, too, some, to some degree. I mean, he... He did mostly have apartments, but that year, that first year, right after the accident, he was saying more crazy stuff to my parents and would leave the house sometimes, I think, at night. And they weren't sure where he was going and whether he had a place to sleep or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Um, so I'm I'm not uh, sure how much more we have on Bruce's uh, life specifically, but maybe we could talk about uh, the uh, arts and uh, uh just mental health issues in general. So what I don't want people to get away uh, from this conversation is, you know, this, th there's this very common idea, right, in the arts and art criticism where uh, mental illness and creativity just are supposed to sort of naturally go hand in hand. One thing that I really appreciate about Bruce's approach to all this, and even when we did a, a show together a, a year or two ago, um, he even emailed me afterwards and he was like, all right, I, I want uh, you to at least, you know, put a note somewhere so people understand that my interpretation of mental illness is that it's something that is overwhelmingly negative, right? It is something that does not necessarily fuel creativity. In fact, it's the opposite. You have to, if you have voices speaking to you, for instance, and they're telling you things that are outside of reality, you have to be strong enough to understand that, no, this is outside of reality. They're trying to either get me to do something that is harmful to me or to others. Uh, they're trying to get me away from my best self. Um, at the same time, uh, it also it's also kind of hard to deny the fact that, uh, it, it, so in Dan's introduction to the selected poetry of, of Bruce, he says something along the lines of, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the brain injury, it's very possible he would have never actually become a poet, right? And specifically in that instance, it's not so much that it's, you know, mental illness in general that would be leading to uh, uh, arts. It's just that in his case, that is one of those I mentioned earlier, these like random variables that ultimately create an artist right like when i look back into my life right i can think any number of random little things could have been different and i probably would have never been interested in writing right i would have never discovered dan i wouldn't have cared about the arts right that's very very possible when you look at um you know maybe some of dan's own experiences growing up i'm positive that they you know very much uh, forged uh, at least some of his approach to the arts, right? Especially that part of Dan that is very insistent on there is a good, there is a bad, and we have to be able to adjudicate in between, right? This is why he was so often, uh, you know, on the side of Bruce and championing him, um, because you know he he sees that value in it, and you know perhaps that has to do with the Dan's upbringing in a you know a very difficult kind of environment where the stakes of actually you know, expressing yourself and, and offering something to the world look very, very different than, for instance, if you're merely an academic poet, right? Where it's like, you know, it's it's a little bit different, right? There's like less native sort of, you know, masculinity or like those classic masculine demands. 
So, um, you know, when we think about uh, his uh, mental health issues, uh, I think it's useful to view them as it's a, a random variable among any number of random variables that perhaps pushed him over the edge and got him to maybe view the the world a certain way. Perhaps it really sort of enhanced his uh, moral critique of the world, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe that turned out to be important for even getting him to write in the first place, right? Uh, if he didn't have these difficulties, maybe he would have just taken the path of least resistance. And uh, I, I believe he wrote a poem along these lines right and again we don't even have to necessarily say this is biographical to bruce you could think you know this might apply to other people maybe it's from someone else's perspective but i think the idea remains uh it's titled tugging sweet chain of events which could have blocked my dreams has dropped blossoms to my mind opened to a tumble of emotion that submerged until i came out the other side it left me seeking brightness, sturdier footsteps, sequ sequential, until I wanted galaxies. Um, and I mean, I, I can't help but think, you know, uh, that uh, specifically for Bruce, this, this uh, you know, sweet chain of events, which could have blocked my dreams, could very well be, you know, everything from the homelessness to the mental ills or whatever. Uh, but, you know, if, if this is a poem written by anybody else, right? Um, you know, this could re refer to something else altogether, right? But, but uh, I think that commonality is is important to think about. Um, I'm not sure if Joel or, or Dan have anything to say about that yeah, specifically. I, 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 I got plenty to say, but it, it, let, let Joel get it out of the way first before I go on a rant. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the, his life experiences is what drove him, and the the vividness and and you know the consequentialness, I guess, of you know he had. I mean, I think, you know, as he said before, he, he sort of grew up thinking, you know, go, law, go to college, go to law school, but just become a kind of successful lawyer, good middle class family. And all of a sudden he's in a different world. All of that, you know, kind of upheaval became the fodder for what he then turned into a different kind of life. And a very important part of it was the the writing that he did. It's, it, it is interesting in the family, you know, it's like we didn't talk about, I mean, I wish I'd known more of this when, he was still alive because he wouldn't really talk about it very much. He would send us all of his stuff to read, not his poems as much as his novels. I mean, he did his City Boys, the major one, but he wrote several other novels too. Um, and and you know, but we none of us we're not a particularly artistic family other than him, and so we, we didn't pay that much attention to it. But there's there's I think he he channeled a lot of his energy into that, and all these experiences were an important part of that. So I I. When thinking about Bruce, and uh, you know, I wrote a basically a book, forty three thousand words, a, a novella length book about Bruce's poems, comparing him to twenty twenty five other poets of different stripes. I think I think Bruce and his mental ills are inextricable uh, for this reason, in that uh, unlike someone like I mentioned, Henry Darger, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, Joel is no Henry Dodger was a guy who lived. Uh, he was a janitor. He lived about seventy years. Uh, this, in the early nineteen seventies, he had been a, he had been a, a, an orphan. He had gone. He had been sexually abused as a child. And people, when they found him afterwards, found his apartment disheveled. But they found this huge book of where he uh, he wrote these the, a so called book about little girls with penises and. Uh, he 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 would do doodles uh, that copied from magazines of the 20s and 30s and 40s, and people were saying, "Oh, this is great found art and whatnot." But I actually read some of the stuff and I saw some of the doodles, and there really wasn't any creativity other than putting stuff together. This was clearly someone who was not there uh, intellectually, and he couldn't make great art. Bruce could make great art. Bruce had the foundation of of the intellect. And I think what happened was uh, his accident or his mental ills or the combination of the, those things in those few years gave him a parallax on life different. You know, I, I said to you the other day, Alex, that Bruce is almost like a Marvel superhero in that if he hadn't had the accident, he probably would have settled down. He, he would have pursued his dream. He probably would have found a woman to marry, have a couple of kids. Uh, have a job, maybe if he if he'd gotten through law school, but once that was all kiboshed, once life put that, Bruce is left adrift, and 
it afforded him a freedom to look at life and think it th think of things in a totally different way. And that's one of the things that separates great artists. It's not, it's not that Bruce had mental ills. Bruce is a great poet. That's the important thing. Whether, you know, when I, and when I go around talking to other people, hopefully in the next year or so on different shows like this for their different YouTube channels or whatnot, number one, Bruce was a great artist, a great poet, and then secondarily, a great novelist, because the poetry is the meat. I mean, uh, he invented a form. I, I mean, I gave it the title, the, the name of an aerial, but he invented this, this prose form. And I, I, I can't conceive that he would have done this had he been happy. It was, I think, this restlessness, this sense of loss, the sense of needing something, in, whether it's Jesus or art or, or whatnot. This is what this is what connects Bruce. So he's a great artist, but he but but you know that he did this with his mental ills is the thing that's mind blowing um and uh you know i i mentioned some of the things about bruce earlier with his guilt about the nylons or the woman who was obese or, or whatnot and uh i think i think bruce is a, an archetype example of the difference between happiness and accomplishment when i would talk to bruce there was always a sort of sighing resign to the fact that he was never going to have the typical you know uh, uh nuclear family of life but by the same token what life took away from him on a personal level it gave him the impetus and he created but he the opportunity to to give back to society in a way that 50 100 years from now when people are saying well you know emily dickinson and bruce ariel you know poets who are different he will be thought of in that vein, and and I want him to be thought of in that vein because, quite frankly, I think he's a better poet than Emily Dickinson. But that's an argument for another show. But I hope you're right, by the way. I, I would love to have that be part of the aerial legacy. But you know, we'll see. Yeah, and um, uh, so I think you know one of the things uh, you know when people talk about you know they only want their kids to be happy. I'm sure I'm sure all of Bruce's parents, uh, his parents, and his family wanted that for him, but. It's better that, I've always said, you know, that's a, a selfish view of life. It's better that you give something back to society. And I think the things that Bruce went went through were, were a boon for the rest of the people that that he worked with, that, that uh, at the church that he went to, uh, you mentioned Tasks Unlimited, the United Methodist Church in, in uh, Hennepin Avenue, I think it is. Uh, and this, this basically transformed Bruce into someone who was conven from from someone who was conventional and and wanting conventional things to someone who was in the the actual you know most definitive uh, term he was non pareil this isn't to say he was the greatest poet it wasn't not to say he's, uh, city boy is the greatest poet, but there is no one like bruce ario and there never will be because he has his own little corner of the universe in these two books that i've edited of almost 600 poems that there's not there's no one like he isn't just like uh, a lot of these people who you know they have this that or the other thing wrong with them or they play up for sympathies uh because of they're from this group or from this religious group or, or whatever it might be um uh bruce bruce is first and foremost a great poet and great writer and secondarily He's an he's an, you can he'll probably become, I think, an avatar of mental ills if he his reputation can get out there. They will say, well, if a man who had, you know, all the things we've listed that went wrong in his life, if he can come and do this, you know, people say, well, can't you be like Bruce Ario? And I think that's one of the things that's important, but it's not nearly as important as he's a great artist, first and foremost. So you, you captured a lot there that I think is so true. It reminds me again of my, you, you are your product of your parents in a lot of ways. And my dad would have all preached exactly the same thing about, you know, life is not about happiness. It's about service and doing, using your talents to, to better the world, accomplish things. You know, my mother would also say, well, your dad could have been a very successful business guy, but that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to, you know, be a pastor or be a teacher. And he was too liberal to be a good pastor. So he had to be a teacher. And he spent his life dedicated to accomplishing things in that world. And so I think Bruce would have been like, yeah, okay, got dealt some some cards here that are pretty tough, but I'm going to take my talents and use them to 
accomplish something. And, and you know, so yes, I think he he would feel well as by one of your literary executor, he felt well captured by that kind of that kind of way you described what he did. And you, you don't have to judge Bruce on a curve too. Uh, and that 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 goes hand in hand with what I just said about about Bruce as being an artist for us and a great one uh, is that uh, again it, 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 the mental illness the struggles that he went through that's just a little bit of elucidation for someone who who is going to be captured by by the poetry because someone who would look at a book of his you know someone fifty years from now goes through the stuff I went through and put together a new book and you know sometimes it takes 25 50 80 100 years for someone to get their due but when they do it the 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 attention that that will be gotten for Bruce and his writing will be because of the writing the rest of the stuff makes for interesting fodder uh but that's what it is it's secondary um I, I don't have anything else to say. I'm not sure if anyone has any uh, closing remarks. Yes, I do. I do. I do want to get on record. I told you, uh, in in uh, putting uh, sending Bruce's book around to about 20 or so people that over the year years I've interviewed regarding poetry, I was looking for people to get blurbs, and I've got one from Don Moss, a friend of his, of Bruce's and mine, uh, and there's a, a couple of other people that I've interviewed that said they will. So hopefully, once I get that in the next month or two, hopefully I will. Uh, I will uh, be able to release the book with two or three blurbs. But I wanted to read an email uh, from someone who I asked uh, to, to give a blurb and who refused to. And and I want to do this because I want Joel and people uh, who don't understand the arts to be able to see the kind of thing that Bruce and any artist of, of merit, but especially Bruce, uh, is up against. Because I do mean, I'll read my email to the person. I won't give his name and I won't uh, uh, say who it is, but I want, I want, it's important that, that, that this is understood. So I sent this email to, to 20 or more people. And so I say, uh, a few years ago, you did an interview with me and I know you have an ongoing interest in all the arts, including literature. A few months ago, an old friend, Bruce Ariel died and appointed me his literary executor. He was a mentally ill man who nonetheless persevered and became a great poet. I don't say such lightly and do not say so merely because he was my friend. I'm going to be putting out a series of his poem books and a novel over the next year on Amazon, and I'm looking for people to read through the poems and, if inclined, say some positive words about the poetry to be used as blurbs. Unfortunately, seeing recommendations is sometimes a better sales tactic than just quality. Whatever meager money made from the sale will go to my friend's estate run by his brothers and will be divided among wh whomever. So, uh, And then I said... Uh, that said, the reason his books are going to be edited and promoted by me uh, is their quality. That he suffered through what he did when alive is germane only to highlight what someone can do regardless of handicap. This book is just awaiting my wife's essay on the unique poetic form, and it has 276 poems. So then I sent a sample of, of the poems from my website, and I said, uh, if you might be interested in looking over the almost completed manuscript, say for one essay, I'll email a copy to you. I want to get the book online at Amazon early next year. Uh, any positive remarks that are blurbable would be appreciated. Thanks for your time, Dan Schneider. So I got, I got, you know, a number of people who, you know, said, oh, you know, it's great what you're doing for him and and, and whatnot. And, uh, 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 but, uh, you know, I'm too busy. I'm this, that. One fellow, though, wrote back and he said, dear Dan, it's nice to hear from you. I hope you're well. And he says, uh, uh, things have been very demanding these last years and especially of late. I appreciate what you are trying to do for Mr. Ariel and the conviction you have uh, as to his work. However, this is not something I can assist with for a variety of reasons. I have to focus on my own writing and my professional work, which is a standard out. I rarely write critically anymore. Uh, he contributes to certain journals and he's got certain interests. I won't go into that. Uh, uh, he said, but the current COVID restrictions are making this extremely difficult. I'm working on a collection of poetry. My sense is that you need a critic or other poet uh, who might be drawn to the work. I remember seeing an interview with Seamus Haney. Seamus Haney won a Nobel Prize, for those who don't know, uh, in poetry. Not long, not so long ago, but one that was televised back in 95, not long after he won the Nobel Prize, and he was asked about the nomination of great poet and what it might take to be one. I liked his response as well as uh, so much about Haney's work and commentary on poetry, po poetics, and the role of the poet. Here's the excerpt. Interviewer. Does it require a certain arrogance to be a great poet? Haney. I prefer to drop all adjectives from the poet. The noun is itself a mighty one. It's one of the few words that retains a sacred aura even still, and it should be more scarce than it actually is. 
Uh, it was clear after that final sentence that Haney sensed he was on shaky territory with implying the Appalachian poet might be too readily applied. But I think he's right about the specter of greatness. For all that, we know there are poets transformed of the genre who change how we conceive of poetry. I don't know if Mr. Ayer is such a poet, but I wish you all the best in your endeavors. And now that sounds like it's a, a nice one. And I, I wrote back simply, Bruce is much better than Haney. Thanks for the reply, Dan. And now you might, someone who, who doesn't know the context might think that, that well, Dan, uh, he was being nice and, and what, uh, no, he was being passive aggressive because the implication was when I stated uh, uh, that Bruce had suffered from mental illness. And I only put that out there simply because, because uh, it's, part, it's part of the whole Bruce area story. Uh, uh, and since Bruce was a white male, you have to sometimes put you know, these kinds of things out there to say, oh, we don't need another white male uh, in the canon or whatnot. But the whole, the, the whole implication of this thing was, I don't have the time to, I'm, I'm a great fan of poetry, I've got my own poetry, and I'm going to talk about and using the, this other poet, Seamus Haney, to basically uh, be condescending. It's a nice tactic that uh, people sometimes use to, to, to say what they want to say, but they don't want to actually say it. Uh, and, you know, if you read between the lines there, it's basically, well, you know, good luck with Bruce there. And, you know, he, you know, you've got your little project there, you know, you know you're helping your friend who, who's, who had some issues or whatnot. But this is, this isn't the thing that an academic uh, needs to get involved with. But of course, an academic, you know, is the perfect person that could, could boost Bruce's uh, uh, profile as a poet within poetry if they got behind it. But, there are two things that go unsaid here. One is, is what he's really saying is he doesn't have the ability to critically judge Bruce's stuff because what happens, and we've talked about critical cribbing before Alex, is critics like to just say the things that other critics have said rather than express their own opinion. And the second thing is he doesn't, doesn't want to stick his neck outside of academia because of people like this Henry Darger that I mentioned, because one of the things about Henry Darger is that after the initial blush and he had a documentary made about his life in the early O's, uh, people have gone to say, well, yeah, well, he, there were things about him and his writing, it's not good and, and it left some egg on some people's faces. So this, this fellow basically doesn't want to stick his neck out in the possibility that Bruce Ayer could be the next Emily Dickinson or the next Walt Whitman or someone who, who went undiscovered. And this is the kind of thing that I know Bruce and I talked about many times at the Uptown Poetry Group in our private conversations and in conversations on my Cosmoetic e-list over the years. And so uh, one of the reasons that I, uh, other than the fact that Bruce is a great poet and I knew him and loved him as a person and a friend, he's he's got, he's up against it because, you know, uh, if if Bruce were black or if he were a lesbian or if he were uh, some other uh, more charitable and more more uh, uh, well uh, thought of minority group, it wouldn't be as difficult. But because Bruce is a white male and the only thing wrong with him was that he had some mental ills and whatnot, and there's still this idea that, oh, he's got, he, he, he just has to work through it kind of thing. Um, this, this, is, this is what Bruce is up against as an artist. Uh, and one of the few good things though is with Bruce being dead now is that, that uh, some of those kinds of biases will give way and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, his, his reputation, his, his, his art will be the thing that stands out. But I just wanted to, to put that, these are the kinds of things, because when I went through, when I went through Bruce's uh, PC, there were hundreds uh, of uh, rejections from agents that talked in the same condescending manner as what I just read from that fellow. And over and over and over and over again, this is the kind of thing that leads to frustration. It also is an ill in society in that we don't want to, uh, you know, put new stuff out there unless it's politically correct. Like we'll talk uh, later about this uh, sight and sound great film list, Alex. But I, I just wanted to put that out there again, uh, that, that this, is, this is the kind of thing that Bruce, I know, uh, and he even wrote, I think, a few times back to agents and to, to publishers where he sent his book, uh, you know, asking questions about stuff. And I, I'm and looking, I'm looking at the the interchanges between them. I'm like, Bruce, you know, Bruce didn't realize he was being, you know, patted on the head uh, by by these people. And this is what led him to 
uh, self-publish uh, his book there, which is another story. But, uh, you know, it cost him probably, a, from what he told me, a, a great deal of his own money to publish his own book, and he didn't get anything for it and uh, whatnot. But these are the things that he's up against, and end of my rant is. So I just want, want people to know, when I talk about Bruce or I talk about any great artist that I've known, I, I'm the kind of per person, I look at the arts as a contact sport. You know, if you want to, if you want to, you know, if you want to get down there in the trenches to use football terminology, you know, I'm going to push back just as hard as you're pushing to get my quarterback, you know. So anyway. Well, I'll ahead. just say one last thing, and I'll be yeah. real brief, brief, brief on this, is, you know, I definitely wanted Bruce's mental illness to be out there in the way we wrote the obituary, the way his service was and so forth. This is a part, big part of his life. Um, but I think he had a good view of it all, which was he did come to terms with mental illness as a disease to some degree, like heart disease or any other kind of disease. I think that's a very important way to think about it. <laughs> but he also always had the view that it was more than that. It's just part of him. It's an integral part of a personality. And he always said that his mental illness could not be treated only by drugs. It had... He, there was a spiritual dimension to how he thought about the world that this enhanced for him and that there was a spiritual aspect to how he lived his life that was influenced by the way the mental illness. So it had an integral aspect in his whole being that I think is important. And a lot of people do have a difficulty and they kind of want to put it in a box over here and they don't know how to respond to it. And sometimes it's very uncharitable the way they respond to it. But overall, Bruce said, yeah, there's some of that, but there's also... It's just part of who I am, and there's a spiritual dimension to me that, that's, you know, richer because of these experiences I've had. So I, I'll leave with that. Yeah. Let, let me just end. Uh, Alex is going, we got to get done with this. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. just, just, two, just, two, just two more points before we go. One is that uh, uh, I wanted to just point out one of the ironies. Uh, when I went through, when I was able to get into Bruce's or ha had someone get into Bruce's PC, uh, and I just wanted to ask this about Bruce's death. Uh, he actually, it looks like, bought glazed tiles for his bathroom. And I, I, I have tiles through most of my house. That they're, they're usually rough that if you, your feet are wet, you know, you're not going to slip. But glazed tiles are more like glass, hence the glaze. I was wondering, uh, it seems an irony. What, did Bruce did die in his bathroom? And I'm wondering if, if getting those glazed tiles, he slipped on them because they were slipperier than what he had before. Uh, do we know anything about uh, his last day there and how he actually died all that we know is that probably that saturday afternoon he slipped in the bathroom and hit his head on the back and fell backwards and hit the radiator and sometime later died we really don't know how fast that happened or any of it uh, but that looks to be what happened because there was never a coroner's inquest there was never you know an autopsy or any of that i mean frankly at that point he was dead we didn't care that much about those issues and so yeah. All we know is that's the most probable thing, but exactly what happened, we don't know. And I just want to say to people who are watching this, uh, there's 576 poems in the two books that I, I put in as publishable, but I know there's a poem called What Shadow that Brajessica remembers is the first poem she ever read of Bruce and Bruce didn't remember it. And, and I'm pretty sure that there's probably, Bruce was kind of slovenly in how he kept the things together. Anyone out there who ever encountered Bruce or got poems from Bruce in a magazine, or was in the Twin Cities and exchanged stuff with Bruce. If you have any poem, poems uh, that if you buy these books and you, you don't see those poems in there, let me know, uh, contact me through Alex or Cosmoetica or whatnot, because I'm sure that there probably are a few hundred poems and probably a good percentage of them, 40 or 50% of them are good poems or better. Uh, this is an ongoing process. It just isn't, these are the poems. There, there are hundreds of poems of Bruce there that were not good. Uh, and and there, there are poems out there in someone's folders that, that knew Bruce back in 98 or something like that. Contact me, let me know. Because as I said, as the years go by, if someone comes up and, and emails me 120 poems that they exchanged with Bruce, Bruce, Bruce wrote, for example, a 74 page a 74 poem book on apples I, I, I don't, it, just on apples and only two of them that i include in the thing but literally he, he wrote about apples uh whether it was apple records by the beatles or apples eating an apple of you know an apple a day kind of thing so 
Anyone out there, let me know if you have any uh, lost, lost Bruce Ariel poems. Um, and, and right before we say uh, goodbye for the patrons, uh, Dan Schneider and I are going to uh, have a bonus show. We're going to be discussing um, the the uh, top 100, uh, the, the recent thing from 2022, the 2022 list from Sight and Sound, right? There's a director director's list. There is a, um, a, a, a critics list. So we're going to discuss some of those films, uh, compare the top film uh to roman polanski's repulsion they're about 10 years apart there should be some interesting contrast there maybe discuss uh, uh russian music some elon musk developments plus a bunch of other topics there's always something to talk about so if you're a patron please stick around and you will get that conversation as well so dan and joe uh thank you for doing this show and for the viewers we'll see you again very soon thank you